Welcome to The Double Stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week, we have a return of Jeff Pilsen to the podcast. Now, he was on way back in episode 41, so if you haven't heard that, I definitely suggest you go check it out because it's a really good one. Now, for this interview, which takes place 10 years later, we covered the last 10 years of his career. And he gives us quite a bit of news on what he's got coming up. So let's get right to it. Here's my conversation with Jeff Pilsen. So we last talked almost exactly 10 years ago. I had you on the podcast and we did a full kind of childhood through into music career up to that point. Okay. And so I was prepping for this and I was kind of shocked at just how much you've done in 10 years since we last talked, (laughs) considering you spent half the year at least on the road with Foreigner, you still have produced a lot of stuff. Yes. So last time we talked, you were finishing last in line. And in fact, while we were talking, Chris Collier showed up to pick up the drive to do the test Mm. mix on that album. Wow. And you played him some of the first song, I think it was Devil and Me, which meant that I got to hear it, (laughs) which was really fun. So let's start there, because that's really where we finished. Let's talk wow. about working on Last in Line and working with Chris, who's now seemed to have gone off. You know, that was a big record for him, and his career has taken off since then. Yeah, well, of course, you know, he did all the corn stuff too, which, you know, it was probably his biggest career helper. And but, um, yeah, Well, yeah, although I think he did that after that. But, um, but he's, uh, well, f- number one, let me start with Chris Collier, who is immensely talented and, um, I haven't gotten to work with him for a while because I've been sort of locked in on the frontier side of, of things. Um, but uh, he's so talented. He's, people that work with him love him. It's he's just he's a, he's a great he's a great guy, great engineer, great producer, great. I mean, everything. Very talented. Can play music, too. He plays, too. Mm-hmm. He's great. Working with Last in Line. Wow. That was the first album in particular was so magical. But actually, both records were magical. But the first one, you know, it was really special. I mean, I got to be in, I mean, I probably mentioned this at the time. I got to be in the room, you know, you know, Vinny, Jimmy, and Vivian playing live. You know, it, that'll never happen again. <laughs> I mean, v- Jimmy's gone. And um, it was, it was really, I, I'm so glad I got to experience that because, you know, that's such a, that's a rare thing in recording these days, you know, having a live band set up and playing and um, it is. And I mean, I was, I was just, I was just engineering and producing, but uh, you know, to get to experience that, like I say, it's rare. So when it happens, it's amazing. When it happens with guys on that level, it's even more amazing. Um, there was some really magical moments with that. And and second record was the same thing. You know, Phil Phil and, and Vivian and Jimmy set up on on songs and played live. And it was it was just amazing. I so working with Last in Line was great. Not to mention the fact that Andrew Freeman is just, you know, he's a phenomenal singer. Mm-hmm. He's he's just a he's a freak of nature. And um so those records, um and they still hold up. Those those are those are solid records and uh, and I'm very, very very proud to have been involved with that. Um, so yeah, last in line, p- great experience. And, and one last question about that is when I, I'd heard him in other things before. Who's him? Andrew, sorry. I'd heard Andrew before. And on those particular records, did you work with him a lot on his vocals? Because there's certain things he did, certain elements of his growl reminded me of you when you sing. <laughs> and I hadn't heard that from him before. Yeah. No, I, I, no, never. I mean, yes, I worked with him on uh, more on the first record. The second record, he did several of his vocals um, in Las Vegas um, separately, remotely. So um, we did work on some, though. But on the first record, yes, I worked with him. But I mean, it's not like I, <laughs> I didn't, I mean, he, he did it. Um, you know, yeah, I, you know, I, I do, I guide, I basically, you know, with a singer of that level, you know, you just want to get a performance that, really represents what they're capable of. And I think we did. Um, yeah, it, you know, I, I didn't have to tell him what to do and I didn't tell him how to growl or, you know, I didn't have to do any of that. Um, uh, it's more about getting the melody right, the dynamics right. Um, 
building building the performance, you know, because you don't want, you know, you can't scream all the way right from the beginning. You know, it's it's all that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, Andrew's got a great sense. I, there, there wasn't much I, I needed to do there. Uh, again, I think I just kind of, I mean, when I produce, I just kind of, I want to hear it as a fan. I, I kind of go into my fan mode and I want to hear it like a fan hears it, um, which I think gives me a good perspective. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's really all I did. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I guess you know some of the melodies we worked out, whatever. But on the first record, but yeah, I mean, he 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 knew what he was doing. He came in very well prepared. Now around that same time, you played bass on the Lynch Mob Rebel record, uh, which was an interesting thing because, as I understand, George's original vision of the post Doc and band was going to be you, him, and Mick which it didn't work out that way. So having you come in all these years later was felt like a bit of a full circle moment to actually play on a Lynch Mob record. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah, that, that was fun. I mean, um, you know, I mean, George and I love to work together, so any chance we get, we'll do it. <laughs> now, Chris mentioned when recording that album, it was pretty wild because he got the, he recorded your bass tracks in your studio, sitting at your seat at your desk, which for him was mm-hmm. very wild. Um, was it, is it a little surreal for you to have somebody else manning the controls while you're in your own studio? Oh, it was great. I loved it. I mean, I, I miss that. I mean, I, I do love to record myself. Don't get any, don't, I mean, no question about that. Um, but again, it's those rare situations where kind of old school, you know, you got a guy, you know, working the stuff you're, you're just playing. Um, and I loved it. No, it was it was great. And and he was great to work with. And we had a lot of fun doing it. And um, I was just uh, very, very happy to be sitting in the seat playing. It was it was great. And he mentioned one more. It's not really a question, but uh, how much of a ride it was, because when you play like you're not just sitting there all still trying to play as clean and perfect and so focused, you're rocking out. Like you're on stage, but you're sitting on a chair and you're just rocking for the whole thing. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, it should be a performance, you know. I mean, and not. I mean, I'm not saying that I do, you know, theatrics or whatever. But um, that's all just natural. When I play, I I move, and to me, that's especially playing bass. That's part of it. Is you know, you're feeling it. You got to feel it. You got to move. Got and and um, so uh, yeah, I probably did do that, but. That's that's when it's working. <laughs> right around that same time, or I don't know. I'm trying to do kind of chronologically here, but actually, wait. You did. Can I interrupt, sir? You? Go ahead. Can I interrupt? Yeah, you? please. Because <laughs> you bring up a funny story. Great. Um, so you know, in 2000, I don't. I, I want to say 2014, somewhere around there. Anyways, uh, uh, Foreigner, we were doing a um, an acoustic record. And we were in New York at a, at a wonderful studio in New York working. And it was a two-story studio. In other words, it had studios on one floor and then the floor above it. Um, so we're, um, we're recording. And this is, mind you, this is us doing an acoustic record. Um, but, but Mick Jones, myself, and Tom Gimbel were out in the room playing together. You know, we wanted to get a vibe. Kelly was singing in the booth. And we're playing. So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing, you know, we're recording acoustic guitars, but, you know, we're, we're getting it live. And so, yeah, I, when I play, I, I get excited, right? So at one point we're playing, the engineer calls out, uh, the engineer being Wynn Win Davis, he calls out over the top. He goes, um, Jeff, um, we just got a very bizarre phone call. Sting is in the studio right below us. And they're complaining that your foot stomping is co- he he's recording a lute record and he's complaining that your foot stomping is causing too much noise. <laughs> on so, the acoustic record. On our acoustic record. <laughs> so for the rest of the acoustic record, I had to play with a pillow underneath okay. my foot. So. <laughs> So yes, I rock out when there I There you go. Perfect. You just record it. <laughs> um, okay, so the Dawkins reunion, again, <laughs> a full circle moment like we mentioned before, um, that must have put some level of completion on, on that experience. You know, recorded a new song, which is killer, by the way. And, you know, got to do a tour and kind of put a little bow on it. Did it feel that way? Like cathartic almost? Well, um, 
Not exactly. Uh, the song did. Yeah, the song felt like, well, I'll tell you what, it's not like it felt like we put a bow on it, but the song felt like, God, we do have a chemistry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it kind of, it kind of like, it, and it sort of just kind of fell together and everybody was involved and, you know, Don had some great ideas and he sang it well. And um, we had a wonderful session together, you know, do, recording the vocals and coming up with everything. It was, it was, it was, it was really great. Um, so, so that was a feeling of like, it's almost like exasperation. Like it can be this easy and good. You know, why do we go in? Why does it become so convoluted sometimes anyways? Um, but then the other side of it is, uh, I, I wish we would have been better live uh, on that tour. I mean, I, I, I was disappointed in some ways. Um, I mean, there was some, there was an energy there, but then, you know, I mean, Don, by his own admission, will say that he was not great on that tour. And I, you know, I don't want to criticize him for that, but um, you know, that's all that's all water under the bridge. But but it made for a disappointing feeling um, about us playing together. Um, so it wasn't the closure you'd think. But here's the weird thing about it: is that we got along during the tour, and that was so nice. It was because, I mean, really, there's, we have all so much together. You know, there's so many memories and there's so many, and we had a really genuinely good time. We went out to eat a few times together. All, I mean, all four of us, it was, it was very bizarre. Um, and it was fun. And that to me was even more important than how good or bad the band was at the time, because in a sense that gave me a little bit of like a comfort, like, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there is something here that we should, you know, we, we, we should, uh, what we did together is something really good and let's keep a positive light on it and um, just recognize that how, how fortunate we were to have that. And, and seriously, I mean, it gave us all careers. Um, there's, there's so much to be grateful for with it. And um, so it was nice to get along and have fun. I wish the band would have been better, but it is what it is. Um, but we proved that we can write a song and come up with new music, which is ironic. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed um, shortly after that, I think End Machine kind of started. Now, was that originally going to be called The End? Was that the idea for that? Well, we would have liked to have called it The End. And yeah, that was Taken or something. So we had to add Machine. So so our original concept was to have The End in capitals and Machine in small letters. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Just work around it. Or like, you know, Bush X yeah. or something back in the day when they couldn't, ha they didn't have the name Bush or something. The End X, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of a, a Dawkins meets the second Lynch Mob combination album. Was the idea to kind of like, well, if Doc is not going to continue this, we can kind of do it this way then? Well, I think, you know, the original idea came from Serafino and Frontiers. And I think the original, yes, the original idea was a bit of, well, if Doc is not going to do something, maybe the three guys from Doc can do something with a really great singer. And that was, and, you know, we knew Robert was great and, um, and we, we all love Robert and, you know, there was a chemistry and a working relationship. So it kind of seemed like a no brainer. It was all it was Serafino's idea and we ran with it. it. It worked out really well. So. So, yeah, there was a little bit of, well, if not, if Dawkins not going to do something, we can at least do something along those lines. Yeah, there was definitely that kind of thinking in there. And, you know, plus, I mean, George and Mick and I love to play together and we have something very strong and natural together, which of course, now that Mick is retired, it's just, it's scary, freaky, how amazing his brother, Steve fits in and plays, sings, and even looks like Mick <laughs> shockingly. So, I mean, we, we really lucked out there in that, you know, I, I mean, it's, there's no way you could ever, change members and have it be so so seamless as if dna was involved <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it feels which is amazing so so um our 
our lake, our our saga continues, and Steve just fit in amazing. And it was certainly fitting to have Mick's final record before retiring be back with you guys too. Yeah, you know, I gotta say, I think so too. And his playing is incredible on that record. Like he sounded great. It's a pity he retired. Yeah, well, Mick is great. Mick is great. I mean, I I get it though. You know, physically he was beat up and in pain and you know i i get it i get it i've i've had my share of pains and problems so i get it um but uh yeah we we miss him but like i say we couldn't have asked for a better person to take his place and it's been working out amazing okay so you did the you did the two records and then on this one you switched singers what led to that decision well again this was a suggestion from frontiers um, and, you know, I always want to make it clear it's not about something that Robert Mason did wrong or anything like that. That's that would be that's so not fair. Um, it really has to do with the fact that uh, the label said, look, we think that this guy could take you guys on an, to another level. Um, that was just their feeling. And then when George and I heard the singer Garish, we were uh, we were blown away and our feeling was, wow, well, it really is worth trying this. Then it turned out he's a great writer. And I mean, to find someone who sings that well and writes that well in our genre was just, it was like magic. And um, so it turned out to be the right decision. Again, I always hate the fact that the first tendency would be to think that Robert did something wrong. And I always want to clear that up because that's not the case. Um, but we're very fortunate that this worked out so well. And Garish is just an incredible musician, singer, writer. And uh, I don't think we, I, I mean, right now it feels so solid and so um, complete. Uh, and we're so happy with this record that uh, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that we've been able to this make record. changes. <laughs> That's the one, yeah. the quantum phase that's been out since March 8th. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we're really fortunate. I mean, it's not many bands can make changes and, and, and feel so good about it. Um, and I've been in situations where we made changes and didn't feel good about right. it. So, so this, one, this one feels really great. Because it's certainly new singer, but it still feels like an end machine record. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, you know, we're, we're, you know, George and I have come to a point where when we're working together, if an idea comes along and it sounds real docony, we don't go, oh, no, no, that's too docony. You know, we don't do that anymore. We're, we're like, hey, that's us. You know, we just came up with this naturally. You know, this is who we are. We this we love this, you know. So we're not we're we're unapologetically, you know, uh, not afraid to use, you know, to to um, sound a bit like our past. And um, the beautiful thing is Garish grew up on that music, loves that music. So he so naturally fits in with it. So, I mean, in some ways, uh, I'm not afraid of saying it's a little more Doc and like than some of the other M Machine records. And um, it seems to have worked out really well. And I'm so excited and pleased that the response is coming. Oh, yeah. And he hits some notes on this record. <laughs> Does he ever? Yeah. Now, was he able to come to your studio to record or did you have to do this all remote? No, we had to do it remotely. He did it in India, which which is another testament to how uh, how great a musician he is. Because working remotely means a lot of emails and Zoom calls and and all that kind of thing. And and you know, I mean, I always prefer to be with the singer. Always, that's all. I, to me, it's always better that way. Um, but uh, it came out really well. I mean, he took direction so incredibly well, it, even to the point that you know, on some of this stuff it involved rewrites and that's the hardest thing is when you have to rewrite something. And, um, so he came through with flying colors on rewriting. That was, that's not an easy thing to do to be told, no, that's not right. Let's try something else. And he did. And man, I, I, again, that's the toughest part about writing. And he just did it so well. He blew our minds. So, um, yeah, kudos to him. And when did you know, you, it sounds such, such a challenge to do this with a singer it's far away and that you don't really know. When did you know like the chemistry was there with it, with him? Uh, the first song he sent. <laughs> when the, when it, the first one he sent was like, 
okay. Well, actually, and it was Killer of the Night, which is our second second single. That was the that was the first song he he put vocals to. And um, well, you know, he would always send a scratch version, and then we'd make our suggestions or whatever. But even the scratch version was really close to what we got. And uh, I mean, it was it was apparent. Okay, this guy gets it. So, yeah, that was that was that was when we were hooked. And I assume, even though it's still heavily promoting this record, that you're you're going to move on in the same direction then with him. Oh, I would. I mean, I can't imagine not. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to um, a Black Swan, which it was such a inspired choice, I think, to get Robin on vocals. He's a legend, mm-hmm. but he hadn't been terribly public in a little while, uh, right. y- you know. So what led to that decision? Well, um, partly my feeling is is exactly what you were alluding to, is that Robin was someone who has so much limitless potential, is so great, but wasn't recognized to the degree he should be. And I've always felt that way about him. Um, and so when when I brought I brought up his name to Serafino, he was like, yes, you know, it was it was it was an instant. And 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 then and look what's happened since he's done solo records. I mean, he has gotten a lot of recognition, um, not just because of Black Swan, but but I mean, I think that kind of helped. And and as I say, he so deserves it. He's also a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. I was the best man at his wedding. So, ah. um, yeah, so, so there's a deep friendship in there too. So, and, and I'd, I'd worked with him many times and I knew how great he'd be to work with. He's the best. So, um, yeah, I, I was uh, very, very happy that that all worked out. Like I figured there must've been a history because in the Wicked Underground CD case, there's like, it's like the, the photo of, of you and George as kids. Isn't one of them his son? Both of them oh, are. They both are. There you go. He, he's got twin boys. Um, and yeah, how did you know that they were his? It's in the credits in the CD. I have the CD and oh. it's in the credits. And, that, you know, so that always kind of stuck in my head. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we knew his we knew his boys were, you know, were little kids at the time. Wow. It's hard to believe that. I mean, one of them just got married. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. It's so funny because I still, you know, we're still close. Um but uh, yeah, no, that 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 is that's odd or ironic. You should mention that. Um, and yeah, yeah, those were his kids. There you go. <laughs> um, so working with Reb again, again, that seems like a, you got the end machine with George, and you got from Dawkin, and then you've got uh, Black Swan with Reb, also from from Dawkin with you. So yeah. you know you're 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 producing all this new music, but it's very much in a way tied into your past. Sure. Um, so working with Reb again and writing with Reb again, uh, well, how is it different than working with George? Wow, good question. Um, well, it's very similar, first off, in that we the approach is very similar. Um, Reb will come in with, he usually comes in with a little more prepared pieces than George does. Um, but he'll come in with, you know, several ideas on, you know, on a flash drive and we listen to them and, and sometimes it's just a riff. Sometimes it's a whole song. Um, but more often than not, we kind of cannibalize parts. Um, and you know, we'll cut, you know, we'll listen to stuff and we'll go, okay, let's work on that one today. And we'll take a riff or whatever. Uh, or maybe like I say, the basic song structure, um, and we'll just hammer it away until it feels right. Um, add the parts that we need and come up with a chorus or whatever. You know, we just start going. Once once we have something to start with, we kind of go. That's generally how it works with Reb. We've done a couple of of, of things though where we just kind of something comes up from scratch and we just kind of go from there. We've done times where we start working on one thing and then by the end of it, the thing we started with isn't even in the song anymore. And you know, it's really really fun. Well, the same process happens with George. That's that's the same way he and I approach things. Um, like I say, he generally he rarely comes up with whole ideas, although sometimes he does. Actually, the song Burning Man on the Quantum Phase record, pretty much musically, that was he he had that all together. Pretty, pretty interesting. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, and so, like I say, with George, it it's a little looser, um, and we just kind of know 
we're going to come up with something, you know, which is, you know, even if it's just a riff or, I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll just put a drum machine on and uh, with a beat and he'll just start playing. And, you know, I mean, if he's ha enjoying his sound and if, and once he gets in the groove, he always comes up with something. I mean, it's just the way he is. Um, so pretty powerful. Um, and that's, you know, that, so, so they're very similar to work with, but, um, it's a, maybe a little looser with George and with Reb, he's a little more prepared. But like I said, with both of them, it could go anywhere. It could go anywhere. And it's, 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 that's the fun of it. Now, it seems in the last, well, I mean, since Last in Line, maybe, you went from producing a lot of records for other bands to now you're like, I'm in Foreigner, I have my two bands and the covers albums, and I'm producing myself. Is that simply a matter of, I don't have any time for anybody else? Or did you make the, the, the decision, no, I want to do my own stuff? Um, <clears throat> no, it just kind of worked uh, that way. Um, and, and there, but, but yes, I'm sort of out of time after, with that, with having those two projects now, plus the Revolution Saints. That too, yeah. And with Revolution Saints, I am just a player, which is nice. I get, you know, because I don't have to produce the records and do the whole thing. So I, um, I'm able to kick back, which means I have a little more time. That, that allow, that's not as time intensive as when you're producing a project. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of booked to the hilt at the moment. <laughs> um, so, uh, I wouldn't say it was a conscious decision. It just kind of fell into place because once I had M Machine and Black Swan, and you know, Black Swan originally, I was going to just produce, and and I did want to bring in a bass player and and have somebody else, and then the band Robin and Reb basically said, "No, man, you got to be in the band." <laughs> so. I would expect then, when Reb's done touring with Winger and you're got a break from Foreigner, that a Black Swan record would probably be in the future. Well, he's already been. He was already out several weeks ago for a week, and we came up with the first seven songs oh, wow. for Black for the new Black Swan, and he is coming out April twenty first again for a week. So we're gonna we're gonna finish up the music in in that space. Um, so yes, there will be a Black Swan record sometime in twenty twenty five. Robin's already started writing vocals for a couple of them, and is yeah he's working on songs right now. So. Um, uh, yeah, no, there will there will be one. We're we're in no hurry. We want to make it great. Um, so I would, but but I would venture sometime into twenty twenty five. We'll have a finished record. Oh, that's exciting! Great. Okay, so the heavy hitters albums, those strike me as an impossibly busy man who suddenly has a day off and he goes down to a studio and starts chipping away at cover songs. And eventually, there's a heavy hitters album. Am I far off the mark on that? Not too far off. I mean, real, where where they came, where that came from, is during the pandemic. Um, George and I, I mean, George doesn't live far from me at all, but you know, we we you know we had to stay isolated because we're a couple of old men, <laughs> and at the time that was you know that was the fear, right? Sure. Um, you know, uh, older guys were very susceptible. So, um, anyways. We wanted to work. We needed to work remotely. Um, I, you know, the 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 idea for the heavy hitters record came because George was doing another record for that label, and they wanted him to do a cover song of a newer, more modern song. Uh, it was, um, oh my God, now I'm spacing on the song. But anyways, anyways, the song we did uh, came out great, and the singer we used was a guy by the name of Will Martin. And the, the label just loved it. So they said, would you do a whole record of covers, basically? And we're like, yes. I mean, how fun is that? And it was perfect because it was during the pandemic. And the first record we did together was all remotely. And it gave George and I a chance to test out working remotely, which is not as good as being in person. But we've kind of figured out a way to do it, and that was the way to do it is on a record, you know, where where you don't have to completely write the songs, um, but but we you know took them apart and rearranged them, which was great, and uh, so that's how we learned to work remotely. Then the second End Machine record uh, was Phase Two. That was done. George's parts were done remotely there, 
Robert and Steve worked with me on that one, but um, but uh, but yeah, they 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 uh, George's tracks were remote because it was still COVID scare. So um, so and because we'd done the heavy hitters record, we knew how to do it, which was great. Even even the writing part, which is which is much trickier. But you know, we would do Zoom calls. We would have Zoom going on. Plus, we'd have this the studio was working. I could actually. I could actually operate George's studio from my studio remote, which was really cool. That was the way to that was the way to do it. So we were really recording into my rig, and it, or, well, no, we were really recording into his rig, but I was running his computer. So it was it was it was great. And then he'd send me the files. It was it was a good system. Um, again, not a, not as good as being in the room together live, but you know, pretty close. And because we know each other so well, it was so it was relatively easy to do so um yeah all very very exciting the the second uh, heavy hitters album i thought bernard fowler was a very inspired choice like his stuff with stevie salas is incredible so what led yeah. you to even like get him on your radar to think of him for that well we i forget all the details but um i know george knew bernard i knew bernard years and years and years ago i mean like 40 years ago, I knew him. Um, and uh, when I think it was George that made the suggestion, it was like, wow, really? Would he want to do this? And we called him up and he goes, yeah, I'd love to. So it was like, how cool is that? And we and we just, it, it just came out great. Bernard is just, uh, he's a obviously an amazing singer, uh, had great ideas, um, loved doing it and uh it just it was a very inspired choice yeah it really was um okay we touched a little bit about revolution saints which is an interesting one for you because again you're you're brought in as a bass player but it seemed that alessandro del vecchio had a big part of that and he has a big part of of all your recent records and now yeah. he's left frontiers so right. will you be able to continue working with him then because he's you know you can hire him the mix or does that mean that things are going to shift well, I mean, I, on the Frontiers a acts, I believe they have somebody new that they want to use on the, the record, the Black Swan and M Machine records. Um, I I haven't worked with them yet, but George has, and George says he's great. So that's probably what we're going to do for M Machine and Black Swan. Um, I don't know about Revolution Saints, honestly. Nobody's mentioned anything to me about what's going to happen with that. What I do know is that Dean is very determined to get the band, meaning Joel and myself, uh, more involved in the writing because, you know, I, I didn't have anything to do with the writing on the two records I've played on so far. So, um, so he, Dean wants to get the band more involved in the writing earlier on. So um, it may be a bit of a new direction for Revolution Saints. I'm not really sure. I mean, I think we'd stay in the same basic direction, but um, maybe a little bit of new blood coming in there. Um, I know that we all three of us would would love to heavy it up a bit. So hopefully, um, an even heavier version of Journey. <laughs> and um, but we'll see. We'll have to see. And um, um, I'm just uh, I I'm kind of excited at the possibilities. I was gonna ask you, you know, as we come to the end here, about uh, you know what's coming up with another potential Black Swan album. But I think you've you've pretty much answered that. So you've got definitely a Black Swan record well in well in well in the way. And there's talk of Revolution Saints uh, doing another record. And then there's always stuff with George. So um, let's just quickly talk Foreigner a little bit. So um, you're doing the Farewell Tour. Uh, you spent a lot of time on the road with them. Um, are you like sad, relieved, mixed feelings about, you know, th this much time on the road coming to an end? Uh, well, this much time on the road coming to an end, I'm very happy about. I'm very ready for that. Um, but, uh, you know, having said that, we are firing on all cylinders right now. So um, I'm going to miss the guys. I mean, we're, we've all gotten real close, and it's the band is just working phenomenally well right now. Uh, so I'm going to miss seeing them as much as I do. I, I will, honestly. Um but not having to travel and being at home is a welcome thing. I'd love to do more recording because I, I, I'm very passionate about that. Um, and, you know, we're all ready to not be on the road as much. I mean, I, I've been doing this for 20 years, 100 shows plus every year, except pandemic. 
Um, and uh, that's a lot. That You know, I didn't necessarily think I was going to be doing this at this age. Um, so, but, so I guess mixed feelings is the answer. Um, but, but all kind of good mixed feelings because even in missing the guys, it's going to be a fond memory and it's, it's nice to have fond memories. Now, do you expect when that tour does come to an end, I know there's a bunch of new dates announced, so this may still be a long one, but do you expect it to be, okay, we're done or is it going to be like, okay, well, we're done, but We'll record here. We'll do a Vegas residency there or whatever that's a little easier on the body. Correct. Um, yeah, we're, we're not disappearing off the face of the earth just yet. We're, we're going to be doing um, – we'll be doing some shows in 2025. It's just this is the end of the nine months of the year on the road kind of thing. And uh, that's a welcome change, I think, on, on everybody's part to a certain degree. Um, but, yes, we will do some shows in 2025. Um, and, um, I'm looking forward to a lighter schedule. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we even have some music that we haven't finished and I'd love to finish that too. So, so yeah, there's, there's, there's other things coming from foreigner. And now the, plus I'm working on a, a, a live record right now. We just recorded last week. Oh, wow. And when I get off the phone with you, I'm going to start editing a live record that, that we're going to be doing, um, that is going to be incredible. It's just going to be an amazing live record. I've been listening to the tracks and it's just, it's right here. I've been working on it. It's, it's amazing. So one more thing about Foreigner is that the, the rock and roll hall of fame, I think the announcement's going to be soon of yeah. who's coming in. Cause I think it's, you know, end of the month or something we're going to hear. I, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's early May that they make the announcement. I think the voting ends at end of April. So, What's it mean to you as a member for a long time to see that kind of recognition finally coming, hopefully, to the band? It's very welcoming and heartwarming um, because I, you know, we know all the original guys and they so deserve this. And I am very, very happy for them. That's, well, like I say, they just, they deserve it and it's good to see. And, you know, the, the reason that they've been kept out of the Hall of Fame for a long time was was just there was somebody that was creating an obstacle and that person's gone now. So it's kind of nice that, um, that we're finally getting the chance. Um, and even the nomination's a great thing, but I mean, if, if, if the band gets in, uh, it's just going to be a phenomenal thing. And like I say, those guys deserve it. They really do. I mean, Mick and Lou are already in the songwriters hall of fame, but they should all be in the rock and roll hall of fame. Absolutely. And one final question before I let you go is I know you've had some back problems in the last little bit. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Uh, I'm still sitting for most of the show, but I, I, I can kind of get up towards the end and, and that's, that's good. Um, and, um, and it doesn't hurt. I mean, it hurts a little bit at the end of the show. Um, but I figure, I, I mean, I mean, I'm building, I'm doing my physical therapy religiously. Um, and I'm trying to really build it back and I'm feeling really good. So, um, I, my my goal is by the summer tour to be able to stand up for a whole show. So, well, if anybody can rock while sitting down, I think we know it's you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just ask Sting. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Thank you so much for coming back on. This has been brilliant. My pleasure, man. Always great. You do you do wonderful work. Thank you. Okay, that was Jeff Pilson filling us in on the last decade, and clearly lots of good stuff coming. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening.